In this video, we're going to review fluids for AP Physics 1. We're going to start by comparing solids, liquids, and gases. These are three primary states of matter. We'll start with solids. Solids have a fixed shape and volume. Liquids have a fixed volume, but not a fixed shape. And gases have neither a fixed shape nor fixed volume. A fluid is any substance that has no fixed shape, such as liquids and gases. Fluids can be described by their density. Density is the ratio of mass to volume. It is measured in kilograms per cubic meter. It can also be measured in the units of grams per cubic centimeter. The equation for density is rho is equal to m over v. Rho is density, m is mass, v is volume. When we say ideal fluid, we're talking about a fluid that is incompressible. That means its density stays constant regardless of pressure. It has no viscosity, which means it flows without resistance. Note that real fluids, such as water and air, do have viscosity and may lose energy to friction or turbulence. Pressure is the perpendicular force per unit area. Pressure is a scalar, means that it just has a magnitude. There's no direction. The unit for pressure is pascals. A pascal is equal to a newton per meter squared, and that makes sense because the equation for pressure is P equal to the force perpendicular divided by the area, and the unit for force is newtons, and the area is meters squared. Pressure in a fluid increases with depth, and here's an equation that represents this idea. P naught is the atmospheric pressure. This is the pressure due to the weight of air above. Rho GH is the gauge pressure. This is due to the weight of the fluid above. And E represents the absolute pressure, which equals the atmospheric pressure plus the gauge pressure. And the H represents the depth of the fluid. So here is a container of water. And as you go further down in this water, the pressure increases. Because down here, there's a lot more water above than up here. And so the pressure up here is less. There's less water above it than down there. And you, there are three holes. If you look at the hole at the bottom, the water is shooting out much further because there's a lot more pressure. And at the top hole, the water's not shooting out as far because there's less pressure. Now we'll take a look at Pascal's principle which states that a change in pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished throughout the fluid. An application of this is hydraulic systems, where you lift a very heavy object with a small amount of force. And the reason we can do this is because the pressure on the input side is equal to the pressure on the output side, and pressure is force divided by the area. On the input side, we have a small area in the piston, and we exert a small force, on the output side, we're going to have a large area, and that's going to allow us to exert a large force on the output side. However, the pressure will still remain the same. The ratios will still remain the same. Now, you're not getting more work than you put into it uh, because the distance that you're pushing down is going to be greater on the input side. You're exerting a small force, but over a bigger, bigger distance. On the output side, you're getting a big force, but it's only moving a small distance. So the work in is going to be equal to the work out, assuming we don't have any friction or turbulence that may cause a loss in energy. Now we'll take a look at the buoyant force, which is an upward force on objects in a fluid. This is due to pressure differences between the top and bottom of the object. We already know that pressure varies with depth. So as you go deeper and deeper down, you have more pressure. Here we have a cylinder. The top of the cylinder has less pressure than the bottom of the cylinder. And since pressure is related to force, more pressure, more force, at the top of the cylinder, there's less pressure pushing down the cylinder. On the bottom, there's more force pushing up on the cylinder. And this, so the net force is going to be upward. The equation for buoyant force is rho Vg, and rho is the density of the fluid. V is the volume of the fluid displaced, and G is the gravitational field strength. Here is a force diagram, and in the down direction, we have gravity force, and in the up direction, we have the buoyant force. If the buoyant force is greater than the gravity force, then the object will rise. If the buoyant force is less than the gravity force, then the object will sink. If the buoyant force is equal to the gravity force, then the object will be neutrally buoyant and will just be suspended at a constant depth in the fluid.
Now we're going to take a look at Archimedes principle, which states that an object immersed in a fluid experiences an upward force equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. Here we have a scale and we're weighing this hook mass, uh, which has a weight of seven newtons. Here is the force diagram of the hook mass. We have FG down and FT going upward. When we lower the weight into the water, we find that the scale reading of the hook mass has decreased. How much has it decreased by? Well, that is affected by the amount of buoyant force that's pushing up on the hook mass. And the amount of force pushing up on the hook mass is related to the amount of water that's displaced, and specifically the weight of the water that's displaced. In this case, it's three newtons. So the amount of water that's displaced has a weight of three newtons, which means that the buoyant force is three newtons. And so the force reading on the scale is only going to be four newtons. And here's a force diagram to illustrate that. The gravity force is seven newtons and the buoyant force is three newtons. Uh, so the tension force now is four newtons because four plus three is equal to seven. Now we'll take a look at fluid flow and continuity. Fluid moves from high to low pressure. Flow in equals flow out reminds us that the fluid cannot magically appear or disappear. And this is, reflects the principle of mass conservation. A way that we can represent flow is by the volume flow rate, which is the volume divided by time is equal to AV. A is the cross-sectional area of the pipe, and V is the flow speed. The continuity equation states that A1V1 equals A2V2. The consequence of this uh, equation is that a wider pipe will result in a slower speed and a narrower pipe will result in a faster speed. Now we'll take a look at Bernoulli's equation, which equates pressure, kinetic energy, and potential energy in flowing fluids. Here is Bernoulli's equation. This part of the equation, one half rho v squared, represents the kinetic energy per unit volume. This part of the equation, rho gy, represents the potential energy per unit volume. Bernoulli's equations assumes that the fluid is incompressible, that it's non-viscous, that it has a steady flow, and it's that flowing along the same streamline. Now we're going to take a look at Torricelli's theorem, which describes the speed of a fluid exiting a hole. Here we have a container of fluid. Notice that there's a hole at the bottom, and we want to find out the speed of the fluid that's flowing out through this hole. We're going to set the top of the fluid as location of position y1, and then the location, the depth of the hole is going to be y2. We're going to use Bernoulli's equation, and we're going to set v1 to zero because at the top of the fluid, even though the fluid is draining, the velocity or the speed of the fluid is very close to zero because it's got a large area. So it's moving very slowly. Also, the pressure on the top of the fluid and right outside the hole is going to equal each other, which is atmospheric pressure, because they're both exposed to air. So that leaves us with rho gy1 is equal to 1 half rho v2 squared plus rho gy2. We're going to move the rho gy2 to the left-hand side. We're going to cancel out the, uh, the rows on both sides. They cancel out. That leaves us with a G uh, times Y1 minus Y2 equal to 1 half V2 squared. We're going to multiply 2 on both sides. That gets rid of the 1 half. And then we're going to square root both sides of the equation. And that leaves us with YV2 is equal to square root 2G delta Y. 